Hello, and welcome to another book discussion in our Indigilet series, a series meant to highlight books by Indigenous authors. And today we will be discussing This Accident of Being Lost, songs and stories written by Leanne Batasamosuke Simpson. I think um, so too. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> um, before we get into the stories, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Marissa, and I work in the outreach department at the Ann Arbor District Library. Ani, uh, my name is Ariel Ojibwe, Ariel Ojibwe Indigenous. I'm a co-host here and a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe. And over to the next person. <laughs> I will pop in. Um, my name's Beth. I'm uh, also on the outreach team of the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm Elizabeth, and I work in the archives department at the Ann Arbor District Library. And I'm Emily, and I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. All right. So we read this book and had a planned discussion about a month ago. And I'm sorry, everyone, that I got sick. And so it might not be as fresh in all of our memories, but hopefully some of it is. Um, and I know that I had a lot of questions when reading this book. So I was thinking maybe we could just throw out some of our questions. Would you like me to start? Or does anyone have a burning question? You, I also you had a lot of questions. I mean, I had a lot of tabs, if anyone. And this book is really short. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of tabs. <laughs> um, I mean, for me as a non-Indigenous person, a lot of it was like, what does this word mean? And like, Google this later. And sometimes I was reading it and I was like, I think I understand this. Do I understand this? And then some of my questions were just like, wait, is this a real story? Or is this like a sci-fi story? Is this a speculative fiction? What, what is happening here? So those were my, like, I have a lot of general questions. <laughs> I really like that fun. too. I liked starting some of the stories and... You know, some of the stories were very much like in present day. Some of them were set a little bit a while ago. Some of them are set in like mythological past present <laughs> or like present with mythological people. And then some of them were the futuristic stories. And often you couldn't tell until halfway through the story or more. And I really loved that. Yeah. I loved that too. Um, pretty early on in reading the book, I realized like, all right, this is, I'm just going to be along for the ride for this book um, and approached it kind of like reading poetry, but kind of like reading essays. And I found when I just read it, which I also at that point thought I needed to do because I uh, had to read it over the course of two days, um, going along with it, I just loved it. I, I, didn't understand a lot of pieces. And it's something that maybe, especially after we talk about it today, I'll be inspired to go back and do a little more research and digging. But because I didn't knowingly have the time to do it when I was reading it, I just powered through and washed along with it. And I I really loved the experience. I noticed the list of words that you had pulled out, Ariel. And yeah. Because I also was like, I need to look some things up. <laughs> I was like, my process too is I would be like, oh, what does this mean? And then write it down. And I'm glad I did because I actually read this like way in advance, like three months ago. Because I was like, oh, it's not for two months, but let me just like be ahead of myself. And then it didn't work out. But um, yeah, so I took a lot of notes, thankfully, from my future self. And that was a lot of it. It was just like, what does this word mean? And I want to remember it for later. And then I also did like... Uh, looking up in the dictionary online, the Ojibwe dictionary, and trying to like commit that to memory. Yeah, one thing that really stood out as a question once I had gone through, so I read it, 
And there were words that I was like, oh, sure, I know that. Or like, I think I know that. I think I recognize that. And then pretty soon I was like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening anymore. Um, So I had to go back and just find all of the words and try to find definitions. And one of the things that like popped out immediately, like from the first story, um, was Sabe, which is kind of um like uh bigfoot and also in the seven grandfathers teachings um the teachings come from different beings like makwi a bear or an eagle or different people different relatives come and give um give a lesson and one of them is sabe and also sabe is sometimes a shapeshifter and um the lesson that this being gives is to like be true to yourself don't forget who you are um yeah and don't try to be some something anybody else so that totally changed the meaning of this being creature whoever in the story because I don't know about you all but like at first when I was reading it I was like what is Sabe like a friend lover and then like are they real and then (laughs) are they just like an alter ego are they made up and I love how they were in the first story with the maple sugaring but then also um when she goes to get her firearm license um they also show up and in that one they're like almost totally clearly an invisible friend until the end when they take some action um which was cutting off the car testicles and (laughs) some some other thing um and then like yeah riding getaway so I was just wondering what your takes on Sabe or that friend were for this person. So the first time I read it, I just read it as like a friend. I was like, I don't know who this is. And then like at the very back, there's a notes section. So that one kind of explained it for me where it said it's the, in the within the context of the Nishinaabe known as known in English as Bigfoot. And I was like, I don't remember any Bigfoot. (laughs) What? And then I had to look back at it and I was kind of a little just confused. And I loved that. Like, I was like, I honestly couldn't tell if this was like the spirit of the ancestors uh, being like, hey girl, you got this. Like... (laughs) like stand up to those those I don't know racist conservative gun (laughs) dudes or like no you can you can go maple sugaring this is your land like go get it but then I was like well why can't why don't the friends know but that makes sense if it's just the spirit moving through you but then later there's also this texting person that she like really loves but has never seen but i think that's a totally different person i think that's a real relationship but i don't know do i don't think any of us know (laughs) i'm i'm really glad everyone got confused too because i (laughs) i was confused but i also so i went into it without first I, i didn't know anything about it and then wasn't the first essay, I'm not, I'm terrible at making, writing notes about it. So the, the essay where it's like, I don't want to say your name. I can't say, I can't think about you. So I have to do something else. Right. So that oh, yeah. was, um, I thought, I thought it was kind of my real true impression was like, oh, wow. I guess anyone could write a book now. <laughs> <laughs> my true impression. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> Okay, no, that's just that. because my mind races all the time. So as I'm reading, I was like, but then I, um, I, I, I don't know. I just changed the way I was looking at it, and I think maybe um, just from other uh, books by uh, Native folks and um, 
having, you know, watching reservation uh, res dogs, right? Just some of those things where you're seeing uh, these other people, like uh, it's very common that they have these interactions with these spirits that, you know, either haunt them or harass them or, you know what I mean? So at some point I was able to like enjoy it better, enjoy the work. Um, it was still confusing. Um, and sometimes just this like seemingly unrequited love kind of aspect of things. I wasn't sure what it meant, if it was really a lover or what, but it it was, it, it was, it was like a window into her into the, her world. That's what it was like for me. I think so too, and I really liked how like, I well how you're saying like anybody could be a writer, and I think that's true. But I also think like that one that you're referencing the twenty two and a half minutes. I love it because of that part. Being a writer sucks. I was yeah. just like very mad about being a writer and or maybe you're just feeding your delusions and neuroses and then advertising it to whoever reads your drivel and you're like Ex excuse me like am I should I be insulted here or not I'm not sure but I also really loved um yeah how relatable it was in that section yes just like whatever consciousness flow but pink pants and also my friend nick um the story is you know like talking to your friend and then the person is right behind you mm -hmm. and then like just pink pants like i don't know if you all do this but you know i work at a desk or people who work at a coffee shop or whatever but someone comes in and they have that characteristic or that thing that they did that stood out that day and you name them that. And then afterward, you're like, oh, what are they going to do today? You know, like it's kind of fun. And I found that relatable. I mean, yeah. it's relatable in that we do work in a public library and <laughs> lots of different people come in and people may or may not be named. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say. I was but totally drawn that. in by that essay. It was it was a good tangible thing for me to hold on to because it felt very much of this of this time um and also the when you do find yourself just like circling thinking of a person and um those are feelings that i i don't miss but boy did i enjoy reading them again um and by having that something that gave me something i could put my hands into to kind of know our main narrator it also then gave me a sense of her personality and her both boldness and shyness somehow at the same time that carries through um so i was on her side pretty much from that point i thought that it was very thoughtfully arranged in the order that it was where we it started out with i think the maple syrup story kicked it off which was maybe one of the more straightforward, um, easier to understand things that you were reading. And then it hit this kind of funny essay and then took some of its perhaps harder to follow turns uh, later on in the book, uh, when at least I was already on uh, fully on board. Was there any harder to follow turns that you, that we could all talk about together? Or that later on in the book that anybody wanted to talk about that were either hard to follow or hard to stomach or hard period. Uh, well, one that uh, that I can recall was uh, again my zero note taking, but um, so there was a plan like she was going to be seeing somebody and she had her spouse with her but and she's gonna be seeing somebody and and that led to i mean it was quite you know a lot of sus suspense about who this would be and it was and maybe you made reference to that earlier with like what were they was it a lover was it a boyfriend was it who was this person but then it was it was what an elk or something it was an animal right and wow. so that was, was a moose, a moose yeah. was it and uh, anyway, I just thought that was really 
uh, striking, just that it, it, it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, and it was cool to imagine it, too, to visualize the way she described it. And a similar reveal when, you know, you're reading about her texting with this being who you assume is a person and then midway through in the story, oh, actually, it's the water. Um, and you kind of reached, I, I found like that was a bit of a like turning point where you either are along with her or it's just too much for you to fully comprehend uh i was talking a little bit with it with one of our coworkers who couldn't make this meeting tonight and they were saying like the the lake i don't know man <laughs> and it is weird it's totally weird but what a, a a good stretch to think of different ways of approaching beingness and that you know maybe maybe humans are not the only things that deserve the being title. Yeah, I like that one. It was confusing at first. I read it a few, well, I read the book twice um, because it, there's a lot to in here. Um, but yeah, it's like if we just think of a lake as like a non-living thing, then it makes less sense. But if the lake is living, then it's like the fun thought of like, well, if the lake is living and it had a cell phone and could text me, <laughs> it's just like a fun thought. I don't know if it, it fully works. Yeah, it personifies the lake, like which is what the indigenous culture does, right? I mean, you're there. We're not the only beings. And hearing talking about now, I'm thinking. I do, like, when I'm heading to Lake Michigan, for sure, when I get to that spot where I get to the re big reveal, you know, it's just like, oh, I've missed you. I love you. You know, and if you have, a, if there's a body of water, we you, you can all relate to that, right? That one that you, um, <clears throat> and even just land that you, the, where you just, are comforted just by being there, by the anticipation of being there and then getting there. <clears throat> that kind of segues perfectly into the one about the boreal forest where mm. they're like touring it and it's like the last place on earth like that. Um, and it's just really sad, but also very beautiful. And I really liked that story. It's like you'll pay, I don't know like how much they paid, but it's probably like thousands of dollars just like get this experience of like being in the forest for the first time. I could have read a novella of that chapter. It, it was so intriguing and she told it so tautly, which I, I recognize that's part of the uh, craft of being a writer is knowing what to share and what not to share. Uh, but I do wish that there was more of that because I was really drawn into that story when you both say you like it is it that how do you how do you like it do you like it because it like eviscerated you because it was so sad or <laughs> or was there another way that you liked it because it was like wow imagine our future not long from now or I think it was like for me all of those things um yeah, it's just like, I like science fiction and I kind of read like science fiction to me. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It just, I've always been really um, interested in the forest. I like spending time in the forest. So like it kind of hit me in a personal level of like, oh man, what would it be like if there were no forests? Like it would just be t horrible and terrible. And this is like, like is not the right word. <laughs> it, it, it's so much of what we read. It's the kind of... It, it got under my skin, which is a reason I enjoy the act of reading, um, even though, yeah, it certainly didn't make me feel good. Yeah. But it gave me the shivers and made me feel something. And I love that sensation of a book when it's, there's something in it that's going to haunt you. And that is going to haunt me. Yeah. Yeah. I liked how even that that piece had humor in it, you know, and I like how all of it 
have humor in it, but I don't know. I don't know. I can't um, make my thoughts be cohesive today about any of these stories. So I'm just going to talk about the part in that that I thought was funny about uh, memorizing the confirmation number. And then she etches it into the right front bumper of the car in case early onset dementia. (laughs) And then later... I also wrote it on the eaves trough of the left side of the house because houses and cars are harder to lose than paper and no one will think to look there. And I was just like, oh God, like I would do something like that. (laughs) And I think there are other people out there who would do that too. And I just really, I really felt that. And I really loved that in this like whole we've lost everything and there's only one bit of beautiful nature left. Like she still takes time for fun and silliness. Um, Also in that, in the less fun and silliness, when the, is it McGeezy um, brings raspberries? Um, He says they are from his Kobade. That's my best guess also at pronouncing that word. Um, but that's your great grandmother. And I also just uh, learned from this seven grandfather's teachings uh, book that Kubade is the same word for either a great great a great grandparent or a great grandchild. Um and I think that fits in with the like seven generations thought some people are definitively on the side of like thinking seven generations ahead how will you plan for the world for your seventh generation descended um some people think of it like a back and forward so that like it's a continual circle um but whatever i think that it's really cool that there is that word that connects and makes a circle of of great either direction um and i think it's cool that it comes up in the context of this story and how we have lost that for our children and they certainly have for their children um and they also have this like around the world clearly um because they're talking about some activists burnt down the Cerrado, a tropical savanna habitat in Brazil by sneaking an old style flint. They wanted open access, which I want too, but in the process, they disappeared the last members of the tropical savanna choir. So yeah, that futuristic, like these bubble domes of wildland are everywhere everywhere around the world. Um, But like who has access to them and how and why and I think that is also a question throughout the book for now and for the future um, in in lots of different ways. Um, and some of them are like the many things that have been have been lost to the people that are here. The accident of being lost. You could go with like the story of the Mississauga and the people. Um, But also, I think that in some interview, Leanne or Dr. Simpson um, said that part of this book was kind of like a response to missing, murdered, and indigenous women and children and two-spirit people, but didn't want to be just like, just being victims, Um, but also talk about like erasure and loss and so I was I was wondering if we could think of some of the things in this book that that are clearly like things that we've lost or perspectives that like we have lost, like the embodiment of our relative Nibish as someone that we could just call up or text or who's like clearly calling out to us like, hey, do you get it? I'm having some issues here. Can you attend to them? (laughs) 
Uh, and the maple sugaring um the first one i think they were talking about like how they had to make a flyer to announce what they were doing because like otherwise they might get someone called on them and they're like what are you doing here um and i wrote down this quote i proofread the flyer one more time because everyone knows white people hate typos and i thought that was really funny Wait. um <laughs> and it was just like it struck me like you lost the ability to just do this ritual which you've been doing for however long and then you you didn't really like you're still doing it but you lost the ability to just go and do it now you have to announce it to all the white people who are gonna like call the police on you because you're tapping a tree in like the vicinity of their house or something which happened not too long ago three years or something i think i already talked about this in rouge park with a group who went there to sugar and the police were called. But that's but now it's a whole thing. So that's good that it's a whole thing that's allowed every year. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. The ability to just like relate with a relative that's taking care of you for who knows how many generations and all you want to do is just like keep up that relationship and you literally have nowhere else to go because all the land has been taken so what do you want to do just tap a maple sugar tree right here in the street but no um i also think the dedication um to Adikwag, wish you were here, because that Adikwag, I guess, means caribou or reindeer. Um, and again, not cohesive thoughts. So in the back of this book, it says that there is a um, musical album that is part of this piece. Um, so I looked that up and they're basically the poems in musical form on Bandcamp. But also on YouTube, there's this really cool claymation version of the sugaring story. It's if you like claymation, it's so cool. And anyway, there is a spirit caribou in there <laughs> who's sparkling throughout the video. Um and made me really notice the dedication um and that in the end of that piece um she's talking about like the overlay of like the people the relatives that could be here or that are sort of here underneath or that could be here in the future but like are are not here are erased um and also in in the claymation piece um there's a newspaper clipping up on the little character's wall and you know when there are just specifics like that you're like mm -mm -mm, that has to be real because it's too either weird or specific uh so I looked it up and then there's a caribou herd that is like was like the southernmost caribou herd in the world um and in 2018 there were just three of them left um, and they were all females, so they were like, well, that's the end of the southernmost caribou herd, which is, I think, the only one that dipped down into the United States sometimes. So I think that is part of the dedication. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. What a bummer. <laughs> you say that. Um, and I think I that's one of the things that the book does a really nice job of. You also talked about the humor and there, it's such a balance. Uh, and I think that we end up talking about this in a lot of the books that we read for this group is that balance of the the depth and the heaviness, but also the humor throughout, um, which certainly gives you something to hold on to, to pull through um, and makes it so that it it doesn't just read like a dirge, even though there are certainly those losses, those things that deserve a mourning. Um, 
kind of going back to that question you asked earlier, I think the I think it was the final piece um, in the collection uh, where she was dealing with there was all that flooding. Um, and that just made me, you know, perhaps it is because it is at the end of the, the book where I'd been thinking about our relationship to our land and our 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 the parts of our home uh, that we have perhaps certainly uh, neglected and thinking about how the impacts of climate change and pulling extreme weather. And again, I don't know how much of that was intentional because that did read like that that was a something that really hit. I guess Not to say that other things didn't true. really happen, but that they yeah. have it happened very literally in the way that it was being told. Um, but just the the nature reacting um, and probably reacting because of poor decisions, large swaths of the human race had had made. Yeah, that piece was both funny and horrible. <laughs> There's a part in there that I like um, where she's talking about, um, you'd think the Christians would be building a big ark. And she says, the Nishinaabeg, though, we didn't waste time building an ark because why in a flood there are like trees everywhere and what's funnier than riding the rapids on a log and why not live in the moment instead of living inside just in case. And I really like that part. Um, and I also really like how like sad is like a character, like capital S. And part of it, I was like, I wasn't sure if it meant like depression or like mourning or, you know, like truly the loss of all these things but it just like showed up in almost every story which is like was very present present just like it was palpable that's true and i didn't even i didn't think of sad as like the loss part i just thought of it as the like depression friend so yeah thinking of it as the loss makes a lot of sense in in this context and like yeah why it just does linger throughout the whole thing but get balanced with that rye <laughs> oh well here we are right along <laughs> um i also thought that the way motherhood showed up was cool. Anybody else think that? Or, <laughs> or think it showed up the same or differently or whatever than they usually think of it? I love that. Well, I think the first time, it comes pretty early in the story or in the book um, where one their friend is breastfeeding their baby and she's like laughing because she's like this is the least queer thing I do and like there's that whole thought and then it kind of moves on and it's the character the main narrator saying like how sexy they are and just like I don't know it's just such a thing that we don't ever <laughs> usually ascribe to motherhood and that's yeah you don't usually see that yeah, that part made me feel weird. Like, I liked it, but it made me feel weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was, I liked the, um, the Tidy Bun. That was that book, right? Tidy Bun? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the way she, and the the dance, the ballet lessons with the daughter and describing, you know, the the white women and, it was just a comical kind of like I I could imagine I I could imagine, you know, the feeling having been that kind of little bit different parent than the other parents maybe, um, so just and and feeling that click clickiness that you can feel when when you're a parent, you know. I thought that was hilarious. And especially the end part, too, when, like, it doesn't, ex I mean, a little. It doesn't exactly get thrown in their face, but a little, because they're like, oh, 
freaking tidy bun, like taking apart everybody's buns. And, you know, they always have whatever stupidity in their purse and snacks or whatever. And then it's time. It's time for the show. And they're like, cool. Like, I scrubbed my kids' tattoos off, like the note said. <laughs> now I'm realizing I'm without a tidy bun or makeup that makes your cheeks look sunburned or blah, blah, blah. And they can't figure out the holes in the costume and whatever. And they're like, okay, like, I guess, you know, maybe there's some value over there. I don't like it, but like, <laughs> I appreciate how these are tools that someone has learned to use. Where's tidy bun now? um yeah and then also like just just talking it through with their kid they my kid is nervous I think she should be I am we are in hostile tidy bun territory without a guidebook or proper supplies or training I lie I tell her it's fine she's awesome the show will be awesome and her costume is awesome she tells me it doesn't feel fine and to stop saying awesome I say that's an important feeling to pay attention to and she tells me that's not great advice at this moment (laughs) Uh, yeah I just I really like how parenting is very real yeah it was very (laughs) and I I like that too it was just like you know whatever indigenous or or white women or whatever color you are kids are going to tell you like it is you know they just do like the Manuman harvesting too, where the author gets all very upset. Marissa, were you going to say something? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, the author is like <laughs> talking about harvesting and then the like tourists are like, oh, I thought Indians, only Indians did that. And she's like, how do you know I'm not an Indian? And then just gets in the car and slams it and then has to talk to the kid who she brought there to have this relationship with wild rice and how she's like trying to explain 400 years of colonization and the kid's like why don't you just say we were on Ashnabe? like that's all you that's all you had to do <laughs> and they're like okay okay maybe i don't have to make everything so deep all the time but manuman was another another thing that's brought up that's like a thing that's lost because of the preference for being able to boat and have clear waterways for trade and no shallows and no swampiness and removing places that those grasses might be but also for cottages like having a clear view of the water and not having the muckiness. And so being able to step, just rip out all the grass and step into a plain swimming place. Um, But when Manumin is like embodied as a spirit, Manumini Keshi, maybe is how I would say it. Um, Manumini Keshi sings. It's like, you know, you're the spirit of Manuman. So like beautiful, graceful. And then it has all this like dirty <laughs> sexual innuendo in there. And you're just like, that is so Anishinaabe. There are just like so many dirty double entendres and sexiness in the language and in jokes all the time. And I think it's because it's not you know, like, it doesn't have the same taboo and weirdness. It's just sex, which is kind of funny and <laughs> and weird and gross sometimes. Sometimes beautiful, sometimes great, but, like, it's also weird and funny. Um, and I, I love how that's, like, in the the beauty of this good berry that, like, is the the basis of the food that that is for the people that they came halfway across the continent looking for and love so dearly it's also a dirty little poem um i have a pop-up let me make sure i don't close anything okay (laughs) 
about the rice, there's a part um, at the end of that story where it says they want a beach, we want rice beds, you can't have both. They want to win, we need to win. They'll still be white people even if they don't have the kind of beach they want. Our kids won't be Mississauga if they can't ever do a single Mississauga thing. I'm thinking about that one. And it's like another way that motherhood is <clears throat> or parenthood mm -hmm. is in there and just the thinking always of the next generation and how you will be teaching them, how you are teaching them, how you hope that they will teach the things that they have learned and how it is hard to teach without land which is the basis for so much learning and understanding of the world he also recently read a tweet that was basically like you can always tell indigenous people apart from colonizers by how they treat the land and how they interact with the land and um like i've been mulling on that for a while too just like the deep connection and seeing it as a food source and like a system and all of that versus just like a pretty beach that doesn't, you don't need it as a rice bed. It's just a pretty beach and you just want your pretty house and your green lawn. <laughs> but then the food has to come somewhere. Don't you always think like, where do you think that the food will come from? Why is it always going to come from somewhere else? Like it could be coming from all around you all of the time. And it is for some, some lucky people. <laughs> um, sort of in that same vein, this is kind of, kind of too much of a question maybe for book club. <laughs> Um, but one of the, something I was reading about, um, in the notes, cause I really loved her notes and how she was like, this line comes from this person and like giving credit where credit is due that usually it isn't explained so thoroughly in the notes. Really appreciated that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the people that she calls out there is talking about like, how are we all complicit in colonization and how are we resisting it? And also I'm wondering like if we are seeing any reflections of ourselves in bits and pieces of this book um, in good ways or less flattering ways. Anyway, I definitely am always struggling there because listen I like bottled soda water I like it a lot I love my LaCroix but what am I doing like why why am I stealing water from somewhere else in Michigan or Wisconsin or something when I have perfectly good water in my tap you know and that we should all be protecting because it's not being protected well and those are things that we all have to try and balance every day. I think one of the things that I've taken away, not just from this read, but from participating in these discussions for, for me, it's been about a year and a half, um, is thinking about my relationship to particularly nature and the land around us and being, being aware and trying to be present in the situations with either whether I'm out there or thinking about, again, what is what is the path? How did this can of sparkly water make its way to me? Um, and sometimes, it, like you said, it, it's, it doesn't feel good sometimes. Sometimes it feels good. But a lot more times I'm 
forcing myself to uh, sit with the discomfort between doing something that is providing me surface comfort, but is maybe ultimately not as good. I, I don't know how many, I don't have a lot of things I can pinpoint to like, this is an action that I would have done, but didn't or vice versa. Uh, but it's certainly something that I am sitting with more. And I think that it's good for me. And so I will keep signing up for these discussions, not just because it's a lovely way to spend an hour and has me reading things I wouldn't, but I think it helps give me those uh, complex feelings that are important as a human. Well, that's so nice. I feel like that's a perf perfect wrap up. So <laughs> Uh, I don't want to like end it in case anyone else would like to speak to that but like yeah well said like the things that give you surface comfort aren't necessarily those things that are going to be good for us and our children and our grandchildren in the long run and I am also grateful that you all have made and helped make this book club so that we could be reminded of these things and talk about them. Miigwech. Thank you. Hi, thank you.